is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering John Carpenter's The Thing, brought to you by David Waters. In this film, an alien that can shapeshift and take over the bodies of living organisms and imitate them exactly terrorizes a group of men in the Antarctic. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty freaky. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. And uh, earlier, about 10 minutes ago, I just finished watching The Thing live on Facebook. So if y'all are interested in seeing some pretty wild facial expressions from me, you can go and check out that video that should still be there. Um, Yama in the chat says, I never watched the thing and I won't, but watching you watch it was priceless. Yeah, this was like, I was really worried about watching a scary movie and depending on what tone they take, they can be really hard for me. Um, but (laughs) money says I DM'd you some choice facial expressions. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll use one of those for an image for this episode. Um, but this was the a type of movie that I was, it, it wasn't as horrible for me to watch as some of them are. Um, there are some that I just can't come out from behind my hands and I am just so tense and anxious the whole time that I'm like exhausted by the end. And this one was actually more of a fun romp in some ways to me. And it shouldn't be considered a romp. I don't think that's what they were going for, but because of how um, over the top everything was. And I went into this not knowing anything about the movie. I didn't know who was in it. I didn't know where it was set. I didn't know what the monster was. I kept thinking, I kept mixing it up in my head with the blob, I think. Um, So once I, when I realized that it was like slightly more modern than I thought, and that it was uh, going to be a, like an alien instead of just like some monster, Um, that changed my whole perspective and what I was, uh, what, how my brain was fixing to react. So for those of you who have never seen the thing, what it boils down to is this alien can turn into, um, take on the appearance of other people by absorbing them. And thus you get to a point that you do not know who is a real person and who is the alien imitating that person. And so the whole thing, it it preys on like paranoia. And by it, I don't mean the thing. I mean the movie. Um, The whole thing is about being paranoid, being isolated. So hence the uh, Antarctic setting. And um, it is, I, I think it's a really wild idea. There are a lot of parts of this movie that did not work for me, but Overall, I thought it was uh, a lot of fun and the effects were crazy town. Obviously, a lot of practical effects. Like you can just tell a lot of practical effects. Um, And that really does make all the difference in that it it gives it this sort of uh, uh, staying power, I guess. Um, And yeah, that there was a lot of goo, a lot of... uh, kind of jerky motion. And um, I looked into it briefly between finishing it up and starting this crowd cast. And apparently there were a lot of motors involved with like expanding the creatures. So that wasn't like a computerized effect. They were actually growing and it was done with motors, which make gives it a sort of surreal, jerky, creepy look. Um, so... Money says, those are Jim Henson shop effects. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, For a creature that is weaponized paranoia, it puts on a surprising good show, says David, indeed. Um, So I'm going to start off with the things that worked for me. Uh, Like I said already, the effects, the location um, is, I think, really key. 
And it starts off with somebody chasing a dog, trying to shoot the dog from a helicopter. And of course, I'm immediately like, these motherfuckers trying to shoot a dog, flying from, that's fucked up. And it turns out that dog is not a dog. Um, And the dude who is chasing the dog, trying to shoot it, is a Norwegian scientist from a Norwegian base. And when he lands and tries to shoot the dog, he accidentally shoots one of the Americans at the American base. And he also um, finally blows up himself and his helicopter. Um, he Well, he doesn't blow up himself. He almost does. And then the uh, guy in charge of the American base shoots him in the head in self-defense since he's already shot one of his own guys. Um, and because, obviously all cannot be well at the Norwegian base if this dude is coming here and acting like this. The uh, the dude, um, Mac, Mac, they just call him, I think his full name is McCready. Um, he goes with a friend to see the Norwegian base and find out what's going on there. And when they get there, the place is destroyed. There's a body of a dude who tried to... who did not try. He succeeded in killing himself. And it's a really fucked up image because the guy clearly they're already like, there was already a breakdown by the time this guy killed himself because the blood pouring out of the slits in his wrists has frozen in process of dripping so that there are like these two long blood icicles coming out of his wrists. And it's pretty messed up. Um, And then they find this like, huge giant square of ice that's like the size of like a moving truck box it's empty and they go outside and find a charred body of some creature that they cannot identify um and there's a lot of evidence of a fight at this place there's a axe in the wall there's blood everywhere shit's torn up shit's burned and they take this creature back with them to their base to examine it and try and figure out what the fuck it is. And meanwhile, this dog that they think they saved from a crazed Norwegian man gets put into the kennel with the other sled dogs and it get it sits there in this real creepy, attentive way. I have to say, this... The, the dog is like one of the most impressive parts of the movie to me because it is really hard to make a dog creepy you can have a dog be scary barking and growling and you know slavering at the mouth you can have a dog be goofy but having a dog be creepy that's like a very particular thing and this dog really really was i they they make sure that he doesn't bark very much when he comes and sits in the kennel he like sits very properly in the center of the kennel very still and staring at the wall in this way that's incredibly unnerving. This whole thing was just really like tense for me because you know something's going to happen, but I did not know what was what it was going to be. Well, spoiler, what it's going to be is some Stranger Things-esque like petals open up in its fucking face and tentacles come out of it everywhere and it starts to grab a hold of the dogs around it. Now, I'm a little bit fuzzy on how this monster works. And this is part of my problem with the movie overall is that they take a lot of liberties deciding what this alien is capable of doing. Every time they want to have it do another crazy thing, they're just like, yeah, all right, we'll have it fly. Yeah, all right, we'll have it tunnel through the ground at top speed as if it's some crazed gopher. It's a... a little bit all over the place to the point that it felt like I wasn't afraid of an alien anymore. It was more like I was afraid of the movie and what they just decided they were going to do. Um, So I didn't really understand why it chooses to move on to taking other dogs at this kennel and trying to absorb them when it is already a dog. It doesn't, it's not, is it, trying to transform into multiple dogs is like because it when i initially was watching i thought that it was going to take over 
the minds of the other dogs or take o- like take over those bodies and thus there would be you know six or eight dogs that were all infected and thus it would spread out the possibility of them being in contact with the people but instead it's just killing the dogs and trying to like imitate them use but it already is one so is anybody in the chat here want to help me out with this because i'm not entirely sure what the point was of this other than to let us see what it can do money says it's just hungry so it's eating um david says that was my understanding that it wants every organism to be it that it can't stand anything to be a non-thing So it just, it can only transform into one dog. It's not like it can suddenly detach and become an extra dog. But if it's not a thing, money says, no, it can be as many as it wants. So that's why it's trying to absorb. It was both Palmer and Norris. Um, I don't remember who you're talking about. Are those the guys later on with the blood test thing with the wire? Um, I'm sorry, guys. Forgive me, because this is stoner and chest mouth. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. Um, so it was gonna try and become multiple dogs. So my initial, like, theory was right, except that I thought that it would take them over, and instead it absorbs them and then kind of spits out second, third, fourth dog selves. Okay. All right. That makes more sense because I was like a little bit confused as to how this worked. Um, Okay, so if they had, (laughs) if it hadn't been quite so dramatic about it and hadn't drawn so much attention, it could have succeeded. But because it just goes way over the top and all of these dogs start to flip out and everybody gets drawn there, it gets lit up. But by the time it's lit up, There's already a guy who did an autopsy on the one that they found at the Norwegian site, and he has been infected. So here goes the other thing that I'm confused about, and this is Blair. Blair is the Wilfred Brimley character. He is the autopsy, uh, what what would you call it, medical examiner? Um, And he, there's this sort of hilarious scene where he's figuring out that Everything will be down the tubes within like a year or two, something like that. 27,000 hours. What's that? Breaking down into years. Um, If this thing gets out, if it it manages to get back to the mainland. Um, Now, he has like this scene where it's like the computer is telling him all of this in a kind of computer speak that was just flat out not possible in 1982. But okay, well, let's go with it and pretend that that's not silly. That's fine. And he, it seems like this sends him over the edge because I don't believe that at this point he's infected. Is he yet? Like when he sits down and is writing all of this, like they've already done the autopsy. And he's at his computer after that, making these notes and reading about this. So it, I guess he wasn't infected via the autopsy, but then he starts to go bananas and break all of their equipment. And it turns out that he like went outside and took out all of the, uh, the helicopters and everything. So this was all him being paranoid that the thing was going to get back to a populated area and begin to spread, right? Um, I think he gets infected by someone else while he's locked up in the shed. Okay, David, that's kind of what I put together. It's a little hard to follow parts of this. Money says, I always assumed either Palmer or Norris went to the shack and infected him while he was marooned out there. Okay. All right, cool. So all of this is to keep it from spreading, except that he's acting so crazy, like, trying to shoot everybody who comes near him because he is, you know, more paranoid than all of them at this point, really, because he knows what the stakes are, I guess. And 
then he tries to be like, it's okay, man. You can let me out. I don't want to hurt anybody. And I'm like, man, that ship has sailed. Um, so, yeah, he wi- winds up getting, like, put alone in a shed. And then later he turns up underground. Um, what's going on with him, though, is really a stretch. And this is the part that I was like, what are you even doing? There's a secret, like, tunnel that goes to a sort of basement root cellar thing underneath the shed that he's being kept in. And there is a flying saucer there that he's been building apparently with scraps from space, from helicopters to make a spaceship. This was the part that made me think that maybe he had been infected and that the alien in his body was trying to build a ship to get him back to some place with civilization so that he could infect more people. Because I am sorry, but I do not buy one second of this, that the secret room has been, like, got built, that he was able to go and pull scrap, like, he's supposedly been locked up this whole time, um, until they finally get there and it's open. So what, he's just been going in and out and collecting scrap and nobody noticed at all that he was leaving and coming back and leaving and coming back? That's the only part of this that I really was like, I'm not even sure why y'all had to include that because that doesn't make sense and it doesn't add anything to the story because they just blow it up like the second they find it. So really for me, that was the main thing that distracted me and made me think that there was going to be something that came of that. And then once they blow it up, I was like, I guess not, but maybe it'll come up again. And then it just didn't. Um, So in my opinion, they could have just gone ahead and left that out because it didn't really make any sense. Um, David, I can justify a lot in this movie, but not that. <laughs> yeah, that's just like, I don't, I just don't understand the purpose of it, you know? Um, especially because the whole thing is supposed to be that he's worried about them being able to, like, have it spread. So I guess his theory is like, well, I'll just wait for all of them to die, and then I'll take my super secret spaceship home and... I won't be infected and it'll be fine and I'll have found a way out. But I just don't know how he planned. Like, what was he just going to come up right through the ground? Did he think that's how that was going to work? Because it's like, I don't know. Anyway, so it doesn't matter. But that was the main thing that I just wanted to get like off my chest off the top because that was so puzzling. Um, So it's a pretty big cast to start off with. Like, what do we got when we start off? Like 10 people in this place, 12 people. Um, there's a couple folks that we never wind up seeing exactly what happens to them. They just disappear. Um, there's that dude, I think his name is Falk. And he is in, he's like the one that finds McCready's clothes outside. His name is Fux. Oh, maybe it's Fuchs. Um, sorry guys, money's telling me. But, uh, this dude he like wanders outside after he hears something and he finds McCready's clothes all torn up outside, which when this creature takes somebody, it usually tears their clothes to shreds. Somehow they get clothes again. I guess the alien can make clothes, um, with its symbiosis, whatever. Um, because if it can make like fur and, and whatnot, I guess clothes aren't that far out of the realm, but, uh, evidently this stuff has been planted so to to cast doubt on McCready because he's the one that's sort of keeping everything together and apparently the alien is aware of that and it's a nice touch because it does plant a seed of doubt in your own mind as a as a viewer as to whether or not McCready is trustworthy and he does the test of his blood with the hot wire later and it, he passes but there's still like a lot of moments that you don't know whether or not to believe him. And it would be a pretty nice fuck you to the audience. If in the end, after him seeming to like bring everybody together and be in command of the situation, if he was the, like one of them. Um, and by the time the movie ends, it's not totally clear. Him and Childs are basically like, well, if one of us is an alien, I guess we're screwed. And they just lay there and like wait to die, essentially. So he could be by then, but I don't think so. But I just, I really did like the, like the addition of that possibility into the mix because it can, you can get sort of, um, 
what's the word I want? Uh, you just, you can take it for granted that the main character that you've been with the whole time is not even on the table as far as being taken over. Um, and having this added in makes you realize like there have been some instances throughout the movie where he hasn't been in the scene with you. You've been with somebody like going to the kennels or you've been with somebody while they're in the autopsy room or whatever, and he hasn't been around. So there, it reminds you that there is totally possibility for him to have been taken over and you didn't see it. Um, there's a fan theory about that. He gives the drink to Childs, but it's kerosene. Childs drinks it because he's an alien and doesn't know it's gross. I guess. Fucking fan theories, man. Some of them, they just like, they, it's like, I, okay, sure. What is, but that doesn't really like matter, right? Um, it's, it's one of the things, like, I, it, uh, yeah, I don't even know what to do with that. Um, so let's say his name is Fuchs. Fuchs winds up disappearing after he follows whatever it is outside. He finds McCready's clothes and he like, there's like a burned patch later when they get to the spot where he had been, his clothes are burned. His glasses are sitting there. So it's like he got burned to death, but like, re like vaporized when he burned to death. It doesn't, there's no bones or body or anything. Right. So are we to assume that he was taken because we never see him show up again as the thing? And there's another dude who winds up disappearing. Oh, um, what's Childs is the one black guy. There's two black guys. There's no women, um, but there's two black guys and Childs is the one. And I can't remember the name of the other. That's the cook who's on the rollerblades all the time or the roller skates. And he winds up wandering off later. Nalls. Okay. Yeah. And he winds up disappearing completely. So it's safe to assume he was taken, but you never actually see that happen and he doesn't turn up as a thing. It's just that he winds up disappearing and then all of a sudden you get the like huge one. Um, so, all right, let's talk about some of the scares here. Because the with the dog, when that thing starts to open up, that I, again, I didn't, I was not sure what this movie was even about coming into it. So when the dog begins to transform, I was just so unprepared for how gross it was going to be. It is so gross. Everything about this creature turning into people is disgusting. And it's really like sort of an in inconsistent thing that occasionally it just uses like um, its tendrils. I don't even want to call them tentacles because they're they're thinner than that. They reach out and strangle uh, dogs or people or whatever. But then there are times where it opens up as a big mouth and like bites people. Um, at one point, it <laughs> there's a dude who, you know, you're having... It doesn't seem like this dude is even aware that he is a thing when he's looking out the window, but he gets, has a pain in his chest and sort of stops and is like, Oh, ow. And then later he collapses. And because you've already seen him by himself, seeming straight puzzled that he has chest pains, you assume that he's genuinely having like a, a heart attack or something. And then doc is given him using a defibrillator and his hands just go right through the guy's chest as the chest opens into like this gaping maw and closes up and bites the guy's hands and arms off. Most of his arm. It is the most shocking thing. Like, again, this is one of those moments where I was like, oh, OK, so I don't know how this alien works at all, because the idea that that was even possible had not entered my mind. Evidently, because it's like a shapeshifter and because every piece of it is like its own organism, there's not one central organism that it's all connected to every bit of, and that's what makes the blood test work, which I'll talk about in a second. They just decide, well, you know what, if it can turn into anything, if it can shapeshift into anything, it can grow a mouth anywhere, which I guess it can like, okay, you know what, why not? Um, and later on, 
the dude, when they do the blood test, there's a guy who's like standing straight across from him and the whole top half of this guy's body splits in half and he just bites the dude's head and shoulders. Like the whole torso turns into a giant jaw and it is crazy town. Um, (laughs) And then he's like suspended upside down with his arms like pinned at his sides because the guy has basically engulfed him from head to like mid bicep. And he's just being like, his feet are hitting the ceiling as he's being yanked back and forth. That scene was really something. Um, So this blood test thing, like when I was watching it, I didn't really understand how it was supposed to work or if it would work. Um, But the theory was that (laughs) the dude that his chest opened up and he ate a guy's arms when they light him on fire, his head like detaches from the part of his body that's on fire and grows legs like a fucking spider and begins to run away. So this leads Mac to theorize that this thing has the ability to um, separate itself in order to for, for self-preservation, that it will avoid harm by, by removing itself from the harmed part of it. So what he does is collects blood from everybody, heats up a wire and dips the wire in the blood to see how it reacts. And if there's no reaction, then it's human blood and it's fine. But if it's the alien's blood, that isn't just blood. That's, that's a little tiny bit of an alien. That's a baby alien. So when he dips the hot wire in the blood that is an alien, that shit comes flying out of that dish and shoots off, like trying to get away from it, splitting into different like little puddles and rolling all over the place. And then the guy whose blood it is that they took it from figures, I guess, well, the jig is up and he just begins to transform into the thing. And this is when we get the lovely, uh, my entire torso is a jaw. When I was watching it, like I said, I didn't understand the theory. And once, like once I was finished and I was thinking back on it, I was like, Oh, okay. I see what he, he meant there. But child's is like not on board with this. I really felt like the entire time I was waiting for child because I, that's the point, right? They make child's as ill tempered. Ill tempered isn't even really because it's more like short tempered, like he he has mood swings. And because of that, you kind of want him to be the alien because he's such a pain in the ass that it would just explain why he's so unpleasant. But right up until the end, it does not appear to be that he is the thing at all. Um, I am not prepared to think that he drinks kerosene. I think that he's just not an alien. Money says Childs doesn't like these white boys wasting his time. Yeah, I really like get the sense that he would have been fine with just how about we all just lock ourselves in closets with some food in a bucket and we just wait this out until somebody comes. Um, and there's also like an aspect that they're trying to get a hold of somebody on the radios and they're not able to get in touch with anybody. I don't know, like, I would assume with 1980s technology, that is a realistic situation. It's really hard to know, you know, like, I don't know what things were like in the Antarctic with studying what kind of technology. Obviously, for certain things, they're going to have access to more advanced equipment than the average person. So they might have had a better chance. But like, um, I just can't imagine what kind of because when this starts the Norwegian being shot that happens on the first day of winter it's specifically mentioned so one assumes that the weather is just starting to get real real bad like first day of winter is usually officially I think it's like what the the 20th of December 21st I feel like 
you've already started to have some pretty bad weather by then. By the time you reach the actual first day of winter and you live in the Antarctic, winters felt like it started like a month ago, at least. Um, so I would assume that plays a part too in not being able to get in touch with anybody that, you know, the worst weather is everything is going to be sort of down. There's going to be a lot of interference with signals and things like that. Um, but I think I mentioned while I was watching that there is a patron of unspoiled who is working at a, um, station in the Antarctic as we speak. And I believe it's a, she and that she's a baker. Um, and she's just like, yeah, I just wanted to do something crazy. And you don't get a ton of adventure when you're baking, but I've found some, which is really crazy and awesome. And I would be curious for uh, her perspective on this whole thing, actually. I wonder if that ever, like, that's got to come up, right? You don't join a team that works in the Antarctic and don't think about the thing. There's no, there's no way you avoid that. Um Let's see. Krista says, most of communication technology, from what I understand, is the same, but I only know physicists who work there, and I trust our baker patron. <laughs> um, Money says, oh, wait, it's the Southern Hemisphere, so June 21st. Oh, right. I forget about the seasons being reversed. That's so crazy and weird to me. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So, <laughs> I... Did, is there... My memory on this is really, really shaky. So if anybody knows, is there an episode of the X-Files that's an essentially complete ripoff of the thing? Because I feel like I watched that and really liked it and thought it was super effective. And now I'm watching this and I'm like, oh, they stole all that shit. Uh, Krista says yes in all caps. Okay. Because um, I wasn't like a massive fan of um, of the X-Files. There were some episodes that were like fun, but most of it was straight up garbage. And that was one of my favorite episodes because there was so much paranoia because there was the isolation. I was just really surprised at how well done it was. And was like actually a little like freaked out by it afterwards. And now I'm realizing it was the best one because it wasn't their writing. Like they just took it. Um, Yes, and everyone died except Scully and Mulder, right? It was an homage according to the director and Carpenter said thanks. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's not, I don't think it's the Antarctic, right? It's like a jungle or something, or maybe it is the Antarctic. I don't remember. But there's something like preventing people from going outside. I think maybe it's an external contaminant, something like that grows in the trees, I think. Um, the X-Files took an Emmy win away from Maggie's dad, so there's that. The X-Files... Like, maybe I'm not remembering things fairly, or maybe TV's just advanced so much more than I f appreciate, but I just can't with that show. Like, the, the the fact that it won an Emmy is really baffling to me. I have been listening to um, the, there's an X-Files, have any of you who are Audible subscribers, they're doing this new thing now where you get two Audible original programs per month in addition to your audio books. And one of the um, programs was X-Files, like basically radio shows with sound effects and the full cast of voices, everything. And um, I was listening to them because there weren't that many that interested me. And it was one of the longest. And I'm going to go for something that's got a lot of playtime. And it was, I, I really hoped that coming at it with a different mindset would help. And it didn't. Um but anyway, this is not an X-Files episode. There were both kinds of episodes, but there was an Antarctic episode with a grub that got into their ears. Okay, I think that's what I'm thinking of. Um, yeah, that sounds familiar. Um, so, okay, where was I? Guy gets eaten um, top half down, and they have to burn the both of them. And at this point, everybody, I think, had sort of like calmed down not exactly calm down, but they, I think they were feeling a little bit encouraged because they'd done this blood test and it seemed like they had gotten everybody. Like, you know, it was taken care of. And the one person that they still had left to test was Blair. And when they go to test Blair, that's when the shit hits the fan because he is not there. And that's when they find the crazy dumbass spaceship. And then... I'm trying to remember exactly what it, where it is, because they go, 
They're they're looking for Blair, trying to track him down. And I, I said when I was watching it that it was an underground steam factory. Um, I don't know what it was supposed to be down there, but the three of them, um, Mac and uh, I keep wanting to say Colonel or Captain, but I think it's not either of those, but it does start with a C. Um, Gary, yeah, but doesn't he have a title? But I'll just call him Gary. Um, and uh, Nalls, right, is... Are they're the three that go down there trying to find Blair. And meanwhile, Childs and one other person, I think, is left up at the top. And they see Childs wandering off and then all the power goes out. Why did this happen? Just Childs, everyone else is dead. Okay, there is an instance, though, when they're standing there watching Childs, right? They see him out the window. It's... I guess it's before they go down into the steam factory. Cause I think I remember it being Mac is one of the people that actually sees him. Why does he turn off the generator? Is it because he's aware that like this thing is relying on power for something like this? There's so many little instances that I got confused in this. I wish I, I noticed and to some degree, this is really effective, but I did notice how little dialogue there is throughout a lot of this movie. And I think that does help with people being paranoid and people being like, um, wanting to remove themselves from human contact and not trusting one another. So I do like that, but I feel like it could have used just a little more to expand on some points that I didn't think were totally clear. Um, because, yeah, at one point, Child's death, I remember that he sneaks away and then all the power goes out. But I don't remember what the purpose was of that because it's a sort of a red herring to make you wonder if he is taken over. But it doesn't seem like he was. And he gives some explanation later and I just don't remember. Um, but in any case, when they go down into the steam factory, this is we see um, Blair come out and uh, take over Gary. And the way that this happens, he like grabs his face and like the skin of his face looks like it's stuck to his fingers. Almost like if you are uh, trying to peel like the skin, like you ever paint your palm with Elmer's glue as a kid. And then you peel the layer of Elmer's glue and you try and see how much of it you can peel off in like one sheet. That's what this looked like to me was that somebody had coated this dude's face in Elmer's glue and it was still a little sticky when Blair touched it. So when he pulled his fingers back, there was like this sheet of skin still stuck to his fingers. It was really cool looking <laughs> to be honest. Um, and this is, these are the moments that I like, just want to know why we don't do practical effects anymore. Like you can't tell me that practical effects are more expensive or at least not enough to be prohibitive with the budgets that these films have. And they are so much better. They're just so much more interesting. Um, so yeah, this guy gets taken and then Nall's like, I think sees his body being dragged away. Um, and then winds up, uh, following and vanishing forever. This is when we get the version of the alien that I finally threw my hands up and was like, okay, sure. I guess we're doing this now because it's a, essentially it becomes like a, I think I said a crazed mole. It's under the ground. And it's traveling through the ground as if it were water, like heading straight for Mac at top speed. Like it's got to be going like 30 miles an hour. And um, it's it like attacks him from underneath. And when it comes up out of the floor, it's enormous. Like it's humongous. I don't know if the more people it eats, the bigger it gets. Like, until it separates pieces off and ma makes additional peoples. But that's kind of what I was assuming there. That, like, it was Mr. Wilford Brimley. Then Mr. Wilford Brimley ate Gary. 
and absorbed that mass. And then they ate gnolls and absorbed that mass. So now it's like just giant, um, which is a pretty cool idea. Like, I wish that this had gone a little further and we got to see it make multiple people at once because you see like parts of it like splitting where there's two faces. So you can see the potential there, but you never actually get to see it occur. And I would have really enjoyed that because it just seems like it would be really phantasmagoric. Um, I like to think Nulls and Fuchs went back to the Norwegian base and are playing cards until spring. You know, I want to be comforted by that, but the Norwegian base was such a fucking like depressing disaster that it doesn't really bring me comfort so much as just make me imagine them like with a third card player with frozen blood dripping out of his wrist sitting there. Um, yeah, there's, there's really nowhere to go. Like they blew up the cavern that had this little spaceship in it. They walk through the whole compound and just toss sticks of dynamite in every room, which I frankly thought was a real self-defeating notion because the whole theory that Max operating under here is that the alien is hoping to outlive everybody and then just go dormant in the ice until a rescue team comes and then basically hitch back, hitchhike back to civilization. So if you're destroying shelter and it's not like these are not big rooms, you can open a room and see if there's anybody in there and that's it. You're destroying your own survival prospects. This thing is not going to be hurt by being left out in the cold. This thing is not going to be hurt by not having a building to hide in. And you can easily see that this thing is not in the room you just threw dynamite into. So what exactly is your goal here? Are they just trying to narrow down places for it to be hiding? Like, okay, we checked this room. He's not in here. Burn that room to the ground until there's no rooms left. Is that really all it is? Like, I guess that makes sense. If they all think they're going to die anyway, and they're just assuming that this is the last act we're going to perform before really like surrendering to the elements. I suppose that's a, a decent way to check off all the boxes. But uh, yeah, that's just so it's a lot. Um, so at the end, he gets attacked by it. It comes at him and he lights a stick of dynamite because it, it jumps out and grabs the detonator that he was going to use to blow up everything. He has everybody like separate to put their sticks of dynamite in different places. And of course, as soon as they separate, that's when they start getting taken. Um, so this thing takes the detonator as if that's going to just not make dynamite work the way dynamite works, because apparently this alien ain't too bright, but yeah, he lights his own stick, throws it in there and this activates all of it. And it goes sky high. Evidently, despite the fact that he's like standing right there, he's fine. And he walks out and uh, meets up with Childs. And it looks like the two of them are the very, very last survivors. So that's how it ends, is the two of them sharing a drink and just being like, welp, guess we're going to die. And you can tack on whatever ending you want that somebody saw the giant explosion and they're going to come and rescue them. But they were like way too far away from anybody. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I don't think like, did anybody theorize about Fuchs? Because I know that I'm fixating on this weirdo, but I just really am trying to figure out what the hell could have happened to him that he got burned up. Do you guys believe in the theory that he like killed himself via a, a flare? How did he burn so that there was no bones left? I just don't understand how that, how we're even supposed to buy that. Like, it doesn't make any sense that Christus is Natasha. It was the eighties. People didn't have the internet. I don't know what you mean. Um, there was, it just wasn't a good shot. Oh, there were bones. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I did not. I did not see that. Um, pile of charred stuff. They didn't linger on it very long because it didn't look good. Oh, okay. All right. So that, because I really couldn't understand why they theorized that when there's no way that his clothes didn't burn, but, and his glasses didn't burn, but his bones burned. Um, 
Chris is, oh, Encyclopedia Britannica didn't tell you what temperature things burned. Yeah, no, unacceptable. Um, all right, so if there were bones, then I, I give it up. He did kill himself with a flare, which is really the most hilarious way to commit suicide I've ever heard of. This is Breakfast Club style, like, what are you thinking? Get a gun or something, dude. Why are you going to light yourself on fire? That's the most painful, horrible thing that I've ever heard. Why would you do that? That seems unnecessary. Like, ah, yeah. Wow. All right, Fuchs. I don't know what you were thinking, buddy, but um, I guess you got out of there. So props to you in a way. But yeah, so do you guys have any questions for me before I wrap this up? Because he's outside trapped and he doesn't want the thing to make a copy of him. Gotta destroy his meat. Oh, money. Take that back. I never want to hear that phrase ever again. Ugh, gross. Um, yeah, I guess you're right that if like he wasn't burned, then it would be able to get a get tissue to make a copy. I like I my feeling is like why do you care after you're dead whether or not there's a copy of you walking around but I guess he actually cares about his friends which um I suppose I'm a bad person for not immediately thinking of so he was like yeah I don't want this thing to be able to fool my friends so maybe I will just take myself out of the equation all right why not sure um hmm okay Krista says, hey, if something kills you, you want to kill it. Yes. I don't know what that means. Sorry, Krista. I'm not following your train of thought here. Um, why Fuchs took it out? He didn't take it out. He took himself out. That's what I'm saying. Um, with a flare. I mean that he cut off an avenue. Oh, oh, I got you. Okay. Um, all right. Well, guys, I feel like I've, uh, I've said everything that I wanted to about this, but this is really fun to do. Um, I appreciate everybody who came to the, uh, the live chat on Facebook because that was entertaining. The only thing is that I have to put the stand for the phone just far enough away that it's so hard for me to read comments unless I get like right up close to it because it's small. And then Facebook collapses long comments and it has a little thing that says read more and I click it and it opens up a thing where I can like block or boot somebody and it does not say what the rest of the comment is. So uh, there were a few people with long comments and I totally could not read them until after I was done, which is pretty much defeats the purpose. But what are you going to do? Um, but yeah, that was really fun. And I'm hoping that somebody I'm going to post the um, image of the, you know, horror movies that I have not yet seen again with this one crossed off so that uh, if anybody is interested in commissioning another one, we can do that. And hopefully people will be able to join me for another one at some point. And um, yeah, thank you very much to David for commissioning this one. This was a lot of fun. And this is a movie that I like once we, I posted that I was going to do this. So many people are like, this is one of my favorites. This is a classic. So I'm really glad to get the opportunity to watch it because uh, I don't think this is one that I would have, you know, it's just, it's hard to get me to watch new stuff. To be honest, I can be very set in my ways. And if I do watch something new, I'm tending, I usually don't go for classics and older movies just because I'm a, I'm a fucking millennial man. Um, barely. So all right, guys, I'm going to let you all go. Thank you again so much for coming. And if you're interested in commissioning something, you can go to unspoiledpodcast.com slash shop. And you can join the Facebook group for commissions at facebook.com slash groups slash spoil me pod. Thank you, everybody, again. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>